about it. Click here. Yes. So tell me when you feel uh, comfortable to start anytime. Okay, uh, 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 let's uh, wait a couple of minutes. Of course, yeah, so more people can arrive. Nope, it's a mistake. <laughs> Probably, I don't need this. Okay, I think uh, we can start. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, Alexander, will you start? Uh, hello everyone and welcome to the Center of Econometrics and Business Analytics. Uh, today we have uh, Robert Reno from University of Verona uh, with a talk about uh, realized uh, drift. Okay, thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to present my work in this uh, seminar series and thanks uh, for everyone attending this, to anyone attending this. So the, um, as I told Anton, I would like to keep it informal, uh, uh, profiting of the Zoom meeting. So please feel free any point in time to interrupt me with questions, clarifications, anything that can help better understanding uh, what, what we do and maybe help us with our research if possible, I would really love to. So this is joint work with Sebastian Laurent, who is at Ex Marseille University, and uh, Xu Ping Shi, who is at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. So what, what do we do in this paper? You see the title is Realized Drift. And I summarized in the first slides the main takeaways of the paper. So we focus on this quantity. I don't know how much you are familiar, but I think you are very familiar with the concept of realized volatility, which is the sum of square intraday returns or power variation, which is the sum of the product of two consecutive absolute value of the returns. Here we take the realized auto covariance, which is just the simple sum of the product of consecutive returns. And we show the main point of the paper is that this guy measures drift, okay? 
So this is the first thing that we show, and this allows us to make a new decomposition of realized volatility. So we know that realized volatility is typically an estimate of quadratic variation, or if you want, of conditional volatility. And we know this has been decomposed already in the literature into two terms, one that comes from the continuous part of the quadratic variation, the smooth movements that we model with a Brownian motion, and one that starts and one that comes from discontinuous big movements of the quadratic variation, which we model by, uh, via jumps. And there is already a big literature showing the uh, the uh, decomposition in these two components is beneficial for modeling and for casting a realized volatility. We add an extra term. We say with a second with a minute, the quadratic variation is not the end of the story. Realized variance is the sum of the squared. So it should contain a bias term. And this bias term is identified by the realized auto covariance. And we show that this, this uh, <clears throat> decomposition is significant. And in particular, it's significant in the sense that it helps for a casting realized volatility. And in particular, we have three theoretical predictions. The first one is that is if you measure realized auto covariance around a positive uh, uh, with high frequency data. And in our empirical application, we use five minutes data. Then you expect to have this centered around a positive value, of course, with noise, but the expected value of this should be positive. The second thing that you expect is that if realized auto covariance is persistent, so if there is some um, dynamics in the behavior of realized auto covariance, then it should predict positively future realized variance. Uh, this is quite, quite obvious if you think about it, because if you accept that this decomposition, decomposition holds, of course, persistence in the realized local variance will translate in predictability of realized variance. The third prediction is that when the realized local variance is persistent, the product of realized local variance times a function, we, we use the square root, uh, because this has been used in literature, but you can think of another function of realized participant predicts a future real, realized variance, but now with a negative coefficient. So there is a negative relation between this quantity and realized variance. And the prediction now comes from a theory of forecasting with measurement error that has been put forward in a paper by uh, Boles, Lev Patton, and Quadvlik, the HRQ model. And then what we do, we uh, verify these predictions on the data and uh, and use them to get better volatility forecasting. So this is kind of this slide kind of summarizes all the main takeaways of the paper. What so, is RQ? RQ RQ is realized quarticity. Well, realized quarticity. So the sum of the fourth powers or similar stuff that is uh, similar to that. It's the reason is that, or what is it? Sorry? What it is QV and RQ is different different things. It's different. QV? So RV is the realized quantity. And here you get the theoretical quantity, QV, which is the quadratic variation of the semi martingale. And RQ, what is RQ? RQ is realized quarticity, the sum of the fourth powers. So realized variance is the sum of the square. Realized quarticity okay. is the sum of the fourth powers. OK, thank you. No problem, of course. More and uh, of course, I didn't put all the precise definitions in here because this is kind of summarizing the main results, but all precise definitions will appear later in, a, in the development of my seminar. Uh, more questions uh, possible? Sure. sure, of course. Any yeah. question, any So by RV, uh, you mean the uh, sum of squared uh, intraday returns, right? Yes, that's or, exactly what I mean. Okay, but then uh, then it cannot. So let, let's. Uh, forget about the bias term for, for a while, right? Okay. So then, then it's kind of strange to have uh, the sample quantity equal exactly the population quantity. On the you are right. totally right. This equality sign should not be intended as a, a, a anything. It's uh, we like you think of the composites that have rise volatility in two terms. Then later on, we will have a precise. A quality sign, which of course will entail a probability distribution limit, a distribution limit in the proper way. So there will be an estimation error here appearing. So you will get the, the right quantity. Here is just a, 
to communicate the idea that on top of the composing quadratic variation in the continuous part and the jump part, we add an additional term in the composition which comes from the drift. Okay, so uh, now it, the third thing is missing the noise, the difference between the sample and uh, the sample realized volatility and kind of population. Of course, the measurement so, error is missing here. Yeah, You're totally right. And my question is this bias term. Is it, yes. uh, how does it relate in, in asymptotic terms to this noise? Is it of the same or smaller yeah, the, or larger? The, theoret term? the theoretical part is about exactly this. I, the noise term is zero mean. The bias term is also zero mean asymptotically, but will be the dominating term in small sum mm -hmm. under special conditions. So I'm going to be extremely precise Okay. about this specific question in, uh, when I arrived to the theoretical part. Thank you. No problem. So let's look at some literature. Um, um, the, I can see that somehow the title of this paper attracts interest because the paper is called Realized Drift. And uh, we know that drift cannot be realized, right? And this has been done in the sense it cannot be measured. And this is known uh, since maybe the work of Merton, but even before, that you cannot measure the drift in the data in small samples. So it's possible to measure the drift somehow, but you really need to have a long sample. So in econometric terms, you need an asymptotic theory which uh, 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 uses an enlarging window. While if you try to estimate the drift in a short sample, using, for example, high frequency data, five minute returns, daily returns, this is just impossible. I mean, the number that you get is really random. And this has been shown by, for example, technical papers by Bandi. What this paper does is kind of uh, challenges this idea that is common in the literature because we show that large drift, drift should not be ignored when estimating volatility, that drifts are not invisible to the high frequency in field sampling, and the drift are persistent and they help volatility forecasting. So we attribute an important role to drift in the econometric or in, in financial econometrics. If you think about the literature on non-negligible drifts, it can basically be summarized into two big streams. The first one is on the deviations from the random walk hypothesis. And there is a huge literature, for example, on bubbles that try to deviate from the random walk hypothesis uh, when you assume there could be trends in the data. And also you can have um, uh, a paper by, uh, there are few, uh, a few papers by, by Shuping that or she, uh, she worked a lot on bubbles and, uh, and like this kind of events in financial data. If you get to high frequency data, there are two papers that are related. And this explains why we wrote this paper together. Uh, there is a paper by Laurent and Shi, and they, it is in Journal of Econometrics, and um, they show that the large, when drift is large in the data, this affects both volatility estimation and jump detection in, in finite sample in a non-negligible way. Another paper is a paper by myself, Kim Christensen, and Roy Lohman, in which we show that in the data, it's very, uh, it's a frequent that drift could explode and generating what we call a drift burst. And this is basically kind of a stylized fact for all financial assets like equities, fixed income, currency, commodities, cryptocurrencies. It's not in the paper, but this can be proved uh, quite, quite easy. Um, uh, about uh, uh, recent literature on drift, it's important, and especially on volatility forecasting with drift, it's important to mention uh, these other contributions. The first one is by Anderson, Lee, Todorov, and Zhu, which study an estimator of volatility in which you remove the part from the drift. However, uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, paper, they use, in order, since as we will show, when the drift explodes, this, uh, the, the estimator they use doesn't really work, what they do, they, on top of this, uh, truncate returns. So they take large um, variation from uh, outliers, we could call them, and they truncate them. Of course, this is done in a, in a, in a neat technical way. And uh, we are different in this study because we don't not truncate, because we show there is no need to do that. And on, honestly, we feel a little bit uncomfortable 
with truncating continuous returns because the truncation techniques that uh, to, by Cecilia Mancini, which is two offices away from here in Verona, uh, it has been devices for jumps, but for that it makes sense because you have continuous variation versus discontinuous variation. So you can draw a, a line. While if you're talking about the same amount article, drift and volatility, everything is continuous. So the truncation is really hard to be decided in practice. And the second main difference is theoretical. In their paper, they allow the drift to explode, but do not allow volatility to explode. We show that we need to allow volatility to explode for, for a complete theoretical treatment, but also because if you allow drift to explode without volatility explosion, of course, the market will be prone to absence of arbitrage violation. So when drift explodes, it's also pretty clear in the data that also volatility is exploding. So exploding volatility is quite compelling in, in the theory. And uh, when I mentioned, maybe when I mentioned the, the fact that uh, realized auto covariance should be positive in the data, this is one of our theoretical prediction. Maybe you jumped on the seat because you thought, because realized covari auto covariance is also used as a liquidity measure. It's the role measure. And in that case, it's negative, okay? So how do we, how do we uh, connect our result on semi-martingales with classical results in financial economics in which serial correlation, typically negative, is used as an estimator of illiquidity? There are two papers, both are in Econometrica, which use the autocovariance as well, but they use it to estimate the autocovariance of market microstructure noise. So it's a different kind of noise. Now you add the noise directly to return, and in this case, you show that in the limit, realized autocovariance tends to the autocovariance of the noise. And the autocovariance of the noise, so can be estimated like this, and this tends to be negative because basically it's the bid-ask bounce effect. So the price jumps from the bid to the ask, so we observe a negative autocorrelation. And indeed, as I said, role, the role measure, it's a classical measure of illiquidity, uses autocovariance to estimate the effective spread, how much do you pay for transaction costs in the data. So it, this is on the other end of the spectrum. So what we say works asymptotically, so we need a solution to get rid of market microstructure noise. Otherwise, we would, would get a negative outcome. And what we do, we show theoretically that if you pre-average, you wash market microstructure noise away, and you get the theoretical prediction that realized autocovariance should be positive in the data. And finally, another paper that is important that I already mentioned is the paper by Boles, Patton, and Quadblick, where they show that if you write the linear models for realized volatility, the coefficients are biased because the error term is time varying. So we correct for this in the same way and this gives rise to our model that we use in the empirical application where we try to forecast volatility. So let me come to the model. So in the model, we start with a semi-martingale. We could call this model non-parametric if there is uh, no alpha and beta here, alpha is zero and beta zero. If alpha is equal to zero and beta is equal to zero, so if the two explosion parts are absent, you are in the classical non-parametric, as it's called sometimes, semi-martingale case, in which the drift is a bounded stochastic process and the volatility is stoch a bounded stochastic process. And this is a very mild assumption. Basically, you are just assuming the prices are semi-martingales. And this is the assumption that is commonly done in the uh, theoretical literature in financial econometrics. And we add now on this model two layers. First of all, we allow for drift explosion in a parametric way. The fact that we use a parametric specification is just for simplicity and doesn't uh, have any implication on the, on, on the theory I'm going to develop. It's just to have a simple model to work with. So we assume that at time tau, the drift can explode with the rate alpha. And at time tau, volatility can also explode with the rate beta. And we call this thing drift burst and volatility burst following Christians and Omen. And so first important point, even if drift explode and volatility explode, the price continues to be continuous. Sorry for the, <laughs> it still continues. Why? Because even if here the drift coefficient goes to infinity, you have to integrate this over dt and then you get a continuous return. And even if volatility goes to infinity, you integrate that over the dwt where w is a Brownian motion and you get a continuous, a continuous random uh, part. 
So the only thing that we need to assume is that there is a little bit of stochastic continuity on the coefficient mu and sigma, meaning that locally they should be smooth, okay, but in stochastic continuity that in a sense. So we allow for jumps in the, in the uh, coefficients, both of the drift and the volatility. And then I will skip the technical conditions. So what's the main intuition of our model? Our model encompasses the classical model and then reaches that. The intuition that is that in the classical model, which is when alpha is equal to zero and beta is equal to zero, the drift is order of probability delta on a small interval and volatility is order of probability square root of delta. So of course, when delta goes to zero, this is the volatility term is gonna prevail asymptotically and there is no hope to see the drift. That's the, the idea that is basically common in the literature. And this is correct and is based on this, on this simple reasoning. So what we're going to do in financial econometrics, you set drift equal to zero, and this is harmless because the drift is not going to enter in any asymptotic approximation. However, what we do, we allow for drift explosion and volatility explosion, and now things change because when you integrate the drift explosion over the S, you get order of probability delta to the power one minus alpha. And when you integrate volatility explosion over DWS, you get something which is order of probability delta to the power one alpha minus beta. So if you restrict alpha to be between zero and one and beta between zero and one half, you will have that the drift will dominate volatility when alpha minus beta is greater than one half. So you can have that the return is made more of the drift than the volatility, even asymptotically. Still, you cannot estimate the drift. That's not going to happen. But the return locally will be dominated by the drift if you are under a drift bars, which is sufficiently strong with respect to the volatility bars. On the other hand, of course, here, when we talk about drift explosion and volatility explosion, it's not necessary to take this extremely, extremely, I mean, uh, literally. What I mean is, assume that you believe that in the data, that there's, there are situations in which the drift is large and volatility is large. Which model is good to identify this? The semi-martingale is not good. Why? Because whatever the size of the drift, if the drift is bounded, in the limit, okay, in the infill limit, the drift will disappear. So we need a model that allows the drift not to disappear when you get to the asymptotic theory. And this model is basically meant for that. It's a kind of a stylized model in which in the limit, the drift can dominate, which means that in a small sample, you want a model large drifts versus uh, small volatility terms, okay? So that's the idea. You, I mean, sometimes people is, uh, uh, doesn't like the idea of exploding stuff in semi martingales but this is still, uh, still um, just a simple mathematical specification for a simple idea that sometimes in the data drift could dominate over volatility. All right, so one important thing to mention is that there is of course uh, a condition for, uh, um, for arbitrage, uh, for uh, absence of arbitrage. And this is exactly the condition under which the drift does not dominate. And of course this is sensible, why? Because if drift dominates over volatility, then of course you can make easily money with a strategy that uh, trend follows the drift. And the, the, in the limit, uh, the strategy will have zero variance. So it will be an arbitrage. So uh, it's important to immediately recognize that in instances in which the drift will dominate, uh, the absence of arbitrage will be violated. But again, this is not a big issue because I mean, it only works asymptotically. And of course, in extreme events like flash crashes where these things have been studied, uh, you don't really want absence of arbitrage to be preserved. In this paper, we are more looking for secular drift, but indeed we have then that in small sample, our theory works also when the drift is, such, is still large enough to be detected by the data but not large enough to allow for a, a, a absence of arbitrage to be violated. Again, this should be considered an asymptotic condition, a technical condition. Okay, so now let's get to the estimators. You, you assume to observe the price of the grid equally sampled. 
you define the return as the differences between log prices, so x here is the logarithmic price. And then basically now we'll tell you a story about three estimators. Maybe I would start from the first one, realize sort of from the second one. Realize volatility is just the sum of the square. Next, our main, main estimator in this paper is the realized autocovariance of order k, which is the sum of the product of two consecutive returns separated by like k. So it's kind of the covariance function. And then I'm also studying this estimator, which is the estimator used by Anderson, B, Todorov, and Zhang, um, that basically is called the rice estimator. How does it work? You take the two consecutive returns, you take the difference, and then you square. What's the idea? The idea is that there is a drift here, and there is a drift here, the drift will go away, so you will be left with something that is measuring volatility. So rice is expected somehow to measure volatility only in the limit, even in the presence of drift. We will show this is partly true in our theory. If you work out the mathematics, it's clear that rack is just the difference between RV and rise. So if you take the difference between the second estimator and the third estimator, you get exactly the first estimator apart from end effects. The difference here in probability is just because the last one cannot be matched because you finish the window. So let's start with realized volatility and let's do asymptotic theory under our model that is semi martingale enriched with drift and volatility explosion. And what you get is not particularly, <laughs> I mean, not particularly nice that realized volatility is still consistent estimator for integrated variance. So the drift does not appear in the limit as was suggested a few minutes ago. Integrated variance, of course, will, in, will also include the volatility explosion part. But since beta is less than one half, this thing is finite and there is no problem. And this is not the end of the story, though. I will show you in a second. Why the, an exploding drift does not appear in realized variance? Let's work out the mathematics in a simple case in which the coefficient of the drift is one and volatility is absent. Then you have realized volatility is just this sum. This can be worked out analytically, and it turns out that it's order of prob it's, this is a deterministic sequence, which is of order delta to the power two minus two alpha. So this delta to the power two minus two alpha will, will always go to zero, even when alpha gets close to one. So when alpha gets close to one, this will go to zero very slowly, but still go to zero. And the, the rest of the sum is made by a series, which is convergent, so it's just a number. Now, in the probability limit, this could be so slow that that could dominate you know, the convergence in the first term. And that's exactly what we show now. Uh, for example, when, when the beta is equal to zero, this guy, guy here will be the bias term, which is order of probability delta to the power two minus two alpha. But when beta is equal to zero, the order of probability of volatility is delta to the power one half. So the bias term will vanish asymptotically, but will dominate the error term when alpha is greater than three fourth, or three over four. So that's the idea. And then we go, and basically this, this, this picture summarizes the main theoretical result. What we have in this picture is the alpha coefficient on the x, like on the x axis, and the beta coefficient on the y-axis. So the case 0, 0 here is the classical case where there is no explosion. Then you have, can have drift explosion the more as you go on the right, and volatility explosion the more as you go on the top. Okay, And then we can separate the, this region into four zones. And the central limit theorem for realized volatility and for rise and for RV will be different in these four zones. Let's see what, what do we have. In the central limit theorem, you will see this quantity appearing. These are called zeta functions. And basically, these are kind of convolutions of the kind of se deterministic sequences that I showed you in the simple case before with the stochastic process, which can be either the drift or the volatility. We call this the zeta, zeta function, because uh, this number will converge, uh, this series will converge to the Riemann zeta. So there is a connection between this series and these quantities that we, we will appear in the central limit theorem. 
So let's look at the central limit theorem. It's divided into four zones. The four zones are those depicted here in the picture. So zone one will be the one that contains the classical case. Zone two will be when volatility is exploding, but drift is not exploding so much. Zone three and zone four will be the zones in which volatility drift is exploding a lot and volatility is not exploding so much, okay? Just to make things clear. So in zone one, what happens? Nothing, okay? You get exactly the same central limit theorem that you would get in the classical case. RV is centered around EV with rate n to the power one half and variance two times integrated quartis, okay? If you are in zone two, zone two is when volatility is exploding, but the drift is not exploding that much. You get something extremely similar. The, this guy here, the variance of realized volatility becomes bigger. Uh, I will show you later. And especially the rate becomes much slower. So when volatility is exploding, RV is still a consistent estimator of EV, of IV, but the precision basically disappears because the rate can get so slow as beta goes to to one half that basically you are not measuring anything. So if you wanna measure volatility during a flash crash, basically you get a random that doesn't make any sense. In zone three, then we have on top on this, the drift is exploding. And during the flash crash, drift was exploding. So what you get in this case, you get exactly what I told you before. So you have rate and n to the power one half and realized variance is now centered around volatility plus integrated variance plus a bias term this bias term will vanish because it's of order delta to the power two minus two alpha, but will dominate the error term, which means that the error, the measurement error or realized volatility when the drift is exploding is dominated by the bias, is not dominated by the variance term. And the same applies in zone four, where the, since the drift and the volatility are both exploding for strongly, the rate is lower and the variance is, is uh, larger, and the bias is the same, but still dominating the variance part. So this is, can, be of, can be of theoretical interest somehow, oh, basically. Uh, yes. May I ask a question? Sure. If you go to the previous slide. One uh, second, sorry. Yes. Uh, concerning the moment conditions, you mentioned force moment being finite. Is that required? If I'm not mistaken, you mentioned force moment being finite. Is that required? I'm thinking about uh, the materials for covariances of returns in large models, for instance, then force moment is needed for temperature normality. How about here and the analogs of the results for realized covariance? Realized covariance will come later. Yeah, yeah, but it's for the moment being finite required. For the mo well, the assumption is here, which kind of implies that the fourth moment is sorry. The, the assumption is more primitive, it's on the semi martingale. So we have required the price to be a semi martingale. And this, uh, uh, yes, this implies the fourth moment exists. Uh, if that be, could, if could sigma that be, is bounded. Uh, can that be realized? I'm thinking about heavy tailedness. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, well, but these are local returns. So for local returns. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that is natural and satisfied, right? Yes, it's totally natural. I mean, we had, mm -hmm. the local, re the conditional returns are Gaussian or close to that. So uh -huh. this is bad. And this is very compelling because the semi Martingale comes from, uh, you know, the no arbitrage theory, basically. So it's a very general class of model. But okay. if you think if you think unconditionally, then you can think about, I don't know, Garch processes with uh, studentized residuals. This could not have a finite fourth moment, but this is not the case here. No problem. So, okay. So this is the theory for RV. And then we try to see whether the rice estimator which is devised to remove the bias, will work. Rice estimator, first result, converges consistently to integrated variance, and this is the same as the rice variance. When we get to the central limit theorem, we see what is the immediately first 
what is the disadvantage of using the rice estimator? It will be centered around integrated variance with the same rate, but the variance will be multiplied now by three, not by two. So the estimator is more noisy than uh, realized variance with a variance that is 50% higher. Of course, uh, everybody knows this is not the efficient estimator of variance, where well, the efficient estimator is realized variance. So it's not surprising that variance is inflated, but uh, we, pay the, we are willing to pay the price for using the rice V because we hope that the bias can be removed by our difference here, the bias term. Actually, and we, go, we jump immediately to zone three, this is not the case, or it is actually partly the case. What do I mean? The bias here will still dominate the variance term because the rate of the bias will be the same as that of realized volatility. But the coefficient in front of the bias will be smaller. I will show you then a numerical example showing you the rice estimator could decrease the bias of realized variance up to a certain extent, but cannot decrease the bias asymptotically in the sense that the rate of the bias will st is still the same and will still dominate the variance term when the drift is exploding. That's why in, in the paper by, one second, that's why in the paper by Anderson Lee, uh, Jeng, and I don't remember, um, they use all, they need to truncate, otherwise rice would not work. Yes, please. So as, as far as I understand in cases one and two, uh, your drift is kind of negligible. Exactly. And it's, not, it's not worth uh, messing with it around. Exactly. Uh, and in cases three and four, it is uh, kind of uh, appreciable that, and can help. So exactly. how do I know from the data in which case I am one, two or three, four? And this Without question is, this is a very good question and I don't know how to answer yet. Okay. This paper does not provide guidance on how to do that. I'm working at basically at the theory in which you can disentangle where you are here. Yeah, but I didn't to know in advance whether I have to uh, follow your route, right? Or you don't know in advance. Plus, but this, so... No, but this doesn't matter because uh, in practice, I will show you. Because I mean, in practice, uh, the decomposition will always be there. Just uh, here will be negligible. So, so whether this is case, I need I, I, I use yours and if uh, if it's not helpful just it won't help it won't help exactly right? that's but exactly it that's it exactly that's the idea okay. because in the, at the end of the day you are using the same estimator as before so our point is that this estimator should be used and notice that this estimator estimator number four has never been used in volatility forecasting okay of course I'm gonna show that if you use this estimator, this is going to help. And my explanation is that this is capturing instances in which drift is relevant and persistent, and so helps you in forecasting rise volatility. But of course, in cases in which drift is small, so you are in case one or two, I mean, the, the estimator is doing its job. The coefficient is still there, but the uh, uh, explanatory variable will be close to zero. And I don't know whether I'm making, I'm making myself clear. The terms are already there, the bias and the variance and the interaction term. In some periods, the bias will dominate, three and four in some zones. In some periods, the variance will dominate, one and two. Here, it's, it's the only case, case four, in which the interaction term is dominating the variance. But again, they are still there, and the data are going to tell you whether these are large or small. The thing I cannot tell you is how to test where you are because I don't know how to do this with realized quantities, but I know how to do this with local quantities. And this is something that we are working at at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thanks. No problem. And for that paper, you have to wait a little bit more because it's gonna be out in a few months, I think. All right, so let's go. Okay, now we investigated the behavior of popular volatility estimator in the presence of drift and volatility explosion, explosion. but the paper is about realized drift. So let me show you what, what you expect by, by the numbers. So if you increase beta, you see, you can uh, inf you inflate the variance 
right? When volatility explodes, variance is inflated, and uh, the variance increase uh, depends on beta in a way that, that uh, the, the, sorry, I'm looking at the variance of the rise estimator. The variance of the rise estimator goes up to 50%, 50% when, uh, um, when there is no explosion. When you increase the explosion rate, uh, rise is less, uh, I mean, is more variable than the rise variance, but not that much because the variance, the coefficient declines. So, which means that in, in presence of strong volatility explosion, it is more or less as precise as realized variance. About the bias, here we can see that the variance of the rise estimator first can even be smaller than the variance of RV when there is drift explanation, and that it can help in reducing the bias. But you can see bias reduction will be more effective when drift explosion is not very large. Indeed, the rise estimator can reduce, uh, can. Uh, reduce the bias effectively when the drift is not too large. When it is very large, like in this case here, alpha equals 0 0.97, the bias reduction is negligible. If you are in kind of an intermediate zone like 0 0.76 for alpha, then you can have a bias reduction of 25%, which is a little bit disappointing because you expect rise estimators to work. And it does only if the drift is not exploding. But now, this is the analysis of variance estimator. Again, our paper is about drift estimation. So we concentrate on RAC. But, but from the above, the above synthetic theory is useful in telling us what's going to happen because we mentioned that RAC is just the difference between RV and RICE. So the difference can move uh, the integrated variance part, which is the limit of both quantities, will will go away and you will be left with the bias. So you can measure the bias using realized auto covariance. So the theorems in this case are in, in under our model, the rack, the auto covariance will be a nice estimator of zero in the limit, will go to zero. But in, in for the central limit theorem, you will see, you, you get that in case one rack is centered out around zero with Bartlett confidence interval. In case two, it's just a noisy, a very noisy estimator of zero. And in case three, and in case four in the next slide, is dominated by the bias. So it will still go to zero, but if you go in small sample first order, what you get is this quantity here. And this is the bias term, it's dominating over the variance term. So that's the main idea of the paper. In case four, you get exactly the same, the bias term, is dominating the variance term, even if the variance term has a larger, uh, in, has a, um, a slower rate. So the idea is that if you take a realized auto covariance and you standardize by two minus two alpha, delta to the power two minus two alpha, you get this zeta function, which is a convolution of mu squared with uh, some uh, specific uh, series. When the drift is constant, uh, for example, this guy is proportional to mu squared. And this guy in front is a number. So this number can be three or four or whatever. So this normalization can get something that is proportional to the squared drift. And that is why we call it realized drift. Um, of course, two things, two comments are important. You get signal about the square drift and not about the drift because the drift is impossible to estimate, of course, but especially the sign of the drift is impossible to, to know. Otherwise, you would easily implement a trading strategy. So you know there, is, there are large trends in the market, but you don't know in which direction. And of course, this standardization is non-feasible because you need to know alpha. And there's no way to know, to know alpha uh, using the data so far. So uh, given the, the non-parametric model that we put forward. So uh, still uh, this quantity, realized auto covariance that we call realized drift is useful to track uh, movements of the drift over time or across stocks because the standardization is assumed to may play a minor role here. So the above theorem allows to, uh, us to make the following predictions. First, if the drift is small, the realized auto covariance will be centered around zero. If the drift is large, it will be centered around the positive value, which grows with mu squared 
and declines with increasing delta. So when you sample more frequently. One, import, one important remark is that I completely ignored jumps so, forth, so far, but the reason is that the realized autocovariance has the, the, is automatically robust to jumps by the same mechanism that makes B power variation robust to jumps. So jumps will change the, uh, part, the variance part of the asymptotic theory, inflating it a little bit, but will not change the rates and the bias. So the same results will hold even in the presence of jumps in the semi martingale Okay, so this said, I will dedicate a little bit of time to market microstructure noise because of course, in the limit, market, uh, the, the variance will, the, realized auto covariance will be dominated by market microstructure noise. And we model market microstructure noise as in uh, the paper by Linton, uh, the recent paper by Linton and Lee and Linton. There is an, uh, as an additive term to the price process, to the log price process, which has an auto covariance structure of hyperbolic type. So it's a very general. Yes. You said gamma S, Roberto? Gamma? Gamma S? Gamma S, yes, is the expected uh -huh. value of the noise at lag S. It's interesting. It means that uh, long memory, essentially long memory is allowed, right? It's a kind of, yeah, it, 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 you allow for long memory dynamics, yeah? Mm -hmm. Thank In you. the noise, yeah. So um, it's what the Linton calls colored noise. So because by long memory, you lose the white noise uh, idea. Okay, so then uh, what we recommend to do is to apply the realized ad hoc covariance on pre-average returns. So first you take your data, then you take a pre-averaging window, you take the average over these windows, and then you compute realized ad hoc covariance. And you can show that if this condition holds, LN is the window you use to pre-average. So if LN is big enough, so if you pre-average over a long enough window, but such that LN is smaller than the distance between two observations. So the idea is that you take one minute data and inside the minute you use a hundred observation to pre-average. That's more or less the idea. Then realized auto covariance will be the same as that of the semi martingale plus a vanishing order of probability. That means that our asymptotic theory, no, not completely, but our main result that the bias is dominating goes through the presence of market microstructure noise if you apply our estimators to pre-average returns instead of the raw returns. All right, now let's get to the empirical application. I have uh, 15 minutes left, but of course the main, main theme of the paper is, is the theoretical, but of course I guess you want to be convinced that this theory helps somewhere. And what we do, we do volatility forecasting. So we have this decomposition, realized variance is more or less equal to rise plus rack, apart from end effects. I define my integrated drift as before. And then I know that realized quantities, and this goes back to the question of uh, Stanislav before, uh, are, uh, the, uh, um, are the uh, continuous quantities plus zero mean error that I call nu and omega, okay? And this error, our synthetic theory shows these are a mixture of normal distribution whose variance depends on delta, alpha, and beta, okay? Then from equation 13, by the sum, it follows that realized volatility is the sum of two quantities and two measurement errors, okay? Now, for simplicity, just for exposition in the model, we will be more, more sophisticated. We assume there is an autoregressive component of both and integrated variance, and this is common, and integrated drift. So we need to assume that the squared drift in the data is persistent somehow so with gamma one greater than zero. Then in this case, simple algebra shows you that realized variance will be a function of past realized volatility, but also of past the realized auto covariance. And then this simple consideration show, uh, suggests that if you regress past realized auto covariance on future realized volatility, it should be positive. And this is unexplored by the existing literature on volatility forecasting. Next, we know that we are misspecifying the model because we know the true model is an autoregression on the true quantities, but we have an autoregression on realized quantities. And then by a simple argument on 
um, um, error in variables. Beta one will be biased and alpha one will be biased. And so to restore the correct beta one and alpha one, you have to correct by the variance of the measurement noise and the variance of the integrated variance. And you can prove using Taylor expansion that these guys here can be proxied by the integrated quarticity. Why? Because integrated quarticity is what you get in the variance of the measurement error by our theory. So this, this idea that actually is the idea of Boles of pattern and quadrilig shows that you should have a negative load of both the product of integrated quarticity, actually the square root times RV on the future variance. And this is what the paper, their paper is about. And the new interaction term, which is the product of the square root of integrated quarticity and realized auto covariance. And again, the second term is unexplored by the forecasting literature. Okay, so this is the idea and how we shape the models. I show you now some data. This is the NASDAQ composite index. We use five million data from 1996 to 2020. And you can see this is realized auto covariance. And you can see that's quite positive. Okay. It's centered uh, 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 around a positive value, somehow declining because this reflects the increased liquidity of, of the market. So the realized auto cover, the market is becoming kind of more efficient. And if you look at the instances in which this is positive and significant, by significant here we mean that we divide the realized auto covariance by a measure of square root quarticity, which more or less proxies its variance, then you see it's pretty persistent. So persistency of realized auto covariance seems to be in the data. Next, we go to modeling our three quantities. The main interest in the literature is in forecasting of realized variance, but of course, we can also forecast realized auto covariance and rise. And let's look at the model for realized variance. It has a hard autoregress, a heterogeneous autoregressive component, like in the model of Corsi. It has an interaction term, like in the model of borderless pattern and quadrilig. On the top of this, our additions are an autoregressive component heterogeneous to account for past autocovariance in future realized variants, and a new interaction term to account for measurement error. So the blue part here of the model is our addition to standard models. And we compare the, our benchmark R, the HAR model of Corsi, and the HAR-Q model of Boller's spot pattern and quadrilateral. Okay, let's look first in sample returns. Realized auto covariance. Here we have without the interaction term, with the interaction term. We can see that there is strong persistence in realized auto covariance. So since persistence is necessary to activate the forecasting effect, we are happy because the data seem to confirm that there is persistence in realized auto covariance. Next. We look at the, well, let's go directly to the estimation of our RV. Rice V is kind of, uh, kind of the same. We estimate with respect to the HAR, the RQ, the HAR with drift, the RQ with drift, and the RQ with drift and correction about the drift. So many specification that all, uh, 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 each one nesting the smaller one. And we see that uh, this is in sample returns. We have uh, negative, here it's a little bit mild interaction effect. This is the one of uh, Boller's pattern and quadrilig. And negative interaction term with realized auto covariance, again, with a significance that is quite mild. This is quite, uh, kind of something that we predict. And uh, if you look at the forecasting power of realized auto covariance on future realized variance, we see this is significant, but only in, in the first term. In the first, the first realized auto covariance is significant in predicting future realized volatility. Again, this is no indication that the model is better, it's just in sample, it's just showing that the predicted effect are kind of captured by the data. To do a proper forecasting exercise, we go out of sample and we use one step ahead out of sample forecasting on a window that is expanding. So we estimate the model in the window, we forecast, then we estimate the window the model in the window plus one and we forecast. And we do this for all our samples starting in June 1st, 2004. So we forecast for 16 years up to 2020. We use three loss functions, okay? 
the two that are mostly used in the literature are the first and the third one, but for completeness, we also use the mean absolute error. And we use the model confidence set of Hansen, Lund, and Nason Econometrica. That is, the model confidence set is a statistical technique that allows you to tell which models cannot be rejected by the data. So to implement this, the outcome will be the percentage of windows. We do this in several windows, different from the expanding window we use for estimating the model. How many times we will reject the different models? Okay, this is the way in which we have the result. So first, let's look at R and RQ. This is a kind of a sanity check because it's very well known that if you add an interaction term to the um, to the realized volatility, it will improve a lot the forecast for realized variance. This is true also for RAC. So you see, for example, for um, uh, RQ or for RAC, it's included in model confidence set almost 100% of the time, while the HAR is not always included, depending on the like on the on on the loss function. For 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 RAC, we cannot use the uh, the my and I don't remember why because it's it can be negative. It can be I don't remember why. So for the ah oh no sorry yes I remember why we cannot use the Q like for RAC because the quantity is positive and negative. So and you can only compute the mean square error and mean absolute error. Now let's jump rise V because we are short in time. For realized variance, you see the result that you expect. The specification, which includes the realized autocovariance and the interaction effect, is almost never rejected. If you leave out the interaction effect, for some loss functions, you can have a little bit less success in, uh, for the model. So the interaction effect seems to be important. If you use standard models in the literature that do not use realized autocovariance, you are definitely much worse. Okay, maybe here you see the RQ is working pretty well for q leak and, and, uh, and the mean square error, which is not a bad result. The RQ is an extremely popular model, and these two measures are the most important. But if you look at the mean absolute error, it is much worse. Okay, so let me conclude. So there is a lot of time for questions. The paper shows that serial autocovariance reveals realized drift at first order. The behavior of realized quantities strongly depends on the interplay between drift and volatility explosion. Accounting for drift using the proposed realized covariance estimator improves the forecasting quality of RB over the standard HAR and RQ specification. And thank you very much. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I have more. Uh, can I? Please. Oh. Could you show the first uh, asymptotic slide? About RV? Yeah. Well, I guess it's... They are all very similar, yeah. Uh, so for simplicity, uh, let's look at first and second case. OK. OK, so f the first case is a kind of pure classical, right? Pure classical, yeah. Uh, let, let's talk even in the, uh, about first case. So if I... Uh, want to do inference on uh, IV, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, do I have to somehow estimate this uh, better or is it uh, is a T statistic will uh, automatically account for that? Uh, for depends, depends which kind of inference you want to do. If you want to estimate the expected value, then you don't need beta. But if you want to know confidence intervals, you need beta. Yeah, yeah. For IV. For IV. You need to. Yes. Yeah. Is it est estimable? No. Better? Not that I know. In the paper with Kim and Royal, we do have estimators for alpha and beta, but in the parametric case. We don't know how to do this in the non parametric case. But in the field, well, uh, when beta is in the rate, um, okay, let's look at the first case when beta is not in the rate. It's yes. only in the asymptotic variance. So yes. uh, wo wo won't the t-statistic, the usual t-statistic, take account automatically for uh, 
better in the under the integral, like in uh, I don't know uh, cointegration. No, I mean this guy here does. You don't need to know beta because this can be estimated consistently. Uh huh. Because so, you take integrated quarticity will converge exactly to this guy. Yeah, right. This is what I. Uh, yeah, you don't need you don't need beta uh -huh. here. And in case two, when beta I, is in the rate. No, I don't know. Uh, because okay. uh, I, uh, you need to know the. Li I think the limit of integrated quarticity will still be that, and so this will be different from this. So uh -huh. we have a different coefficient and a different rate. Uh -huh. And I don't okay. know how to how to make this feasible. Maybe it's possible. That's a good research question. I have no idea. Yeah. To have a okay. feasible estimator of this variance, but it okay. shouldn't be quarticity. So you are more uh, um, inclined to do predictions rather than this inference, right? Uh, I'm inclined to both. Just I can do something. I cannot do that. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but I'm inclined to both. Yes, that's a good point. That's definitely a good point how to make prediction about all parts here inference about all these yeah. parts here is for for what concerns me an open problem uh -huh. so i'm done thank you <laughs> thank you so much yeah so may i ask a question sure uh Roberto, could you come to slide with uh replied uh, results from last slide maybe the noise part this one no table with uh, results of application ah the, the the main predicting table yeah, this sorry. one no sorry this one yeah for example yeah so this hard uh, q d q model looks better but can you say in uh, what is improvement in prediction of realized volatility is this model comparing to hard or hard Q model? Very thin. How Very many thin. percentage relative errors? Very thin. What, what, what is very thin? Very thin, like 1%. Ah, so no real Yeah, improvement. very thin, yeah. But this is well known in the volatility forecasting literature because once you have the, the standard hard, the quality the economic quality of forecast is really negligible with respect to even more complicated models. So it's very hard to, to beat the HAR in economic terms. So in this case, we can make better than HAR, but few percent, and better than RQ, but I would say 1%. Thank you. Thank you. While the HAR is strongly better than the GARGE. Any other question? Comment? Well, m maybe one minor. Uh, the HAR models, uh, yeah, they are sometimes criticized. Uh, yeah, from the point of view of uh, lasso selection, for example, etc. So, would you consider uh, some other models like MEM type models for? Uh... Well, I, I, uh, one, a postdoc of mine uh, is present here as Giorgio. You can see him. And we are working at uh, modeling with the Kalman filter and using the, and we think this is a good way because MEM in, well, I'm not a big expert with MEM, but basically I think the aggregating frequency is more or less the same of R. While you can get a much better forecasting performance than R if you allow the coefficient to be dynamic and estimating them by Kalman filter can help. And so we are exploring that, uh, that area. So this answers your question, I guess. I'm not, of course, of course, when you do forecasting, you can do whatever, yeah. but uh, I think the, the key to improve a hard specification is to allow for changing coefficients over time mm -hmm. instead of just changing the model. What, what, what's that, uh, that model called? How, what's the name of it with, uh, with varying coefficients? I think it's called HARC, Har Kalman, yes. Ah, okay. Har Kalman, yes. 
and that uh, allows you to have time varying coefficients and using our measurement error here you can use this equation 14 and 15 as measurement equations uh -huh. then you need to linearize and then this so you work on the log well too and much hustle maybe <laughs> no, no 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 it's easy it's easy it's not difficult but the, but the advantage is that uh, if uh, you have two advantages if you do the log and the Kalman. The log is uh, that you don't need the Q term here. You don't need to correct for measurement error because when you take the log, the error is not time varying anymore. Mm -hmm. And the other advantage, of course, if the, there is a big, if the persistence changes over time, you can capture that. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, imagining COVID, of course. We can think that volatility were more, more persistent than usual. So this can be captured. Uh -huh. Thanks. Welcome. Any other questions? Okay, then I uh, thank again uh, Roberto for the talk. Uh, Hey, thank you guys for having me here. It was a pleasure. Now I, I go to I go to lunch because it's uh, uh, I'm one hour behind you. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. See you. See you, and happy to interact anytime if you do something le like this, a workshop, whatever. Happy to happy to collaborate. Bye bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye, Roberto. Thank you. его имя, фамилию, то есть произносить правильно. Кто знает? Что, никого здесь нет? Физиономии есть, а людей нет? Кого Ой, фамилия? Да. Ну, Рено. Там над О какая-то фиговина стоит. А, не, я не знаю. Что-то ты какой-то уставший. Я только что проснулся, я в Майами, 7, 8 часов утра. Ой, ужас какой, спал бы тогда. Подумаешь, один mm -hmm. Рено, другой Рено. Да не, мне, я не могу спать, у меня тут еще австралийское время. Австралийское время, 0 часов, 0 минут. Что у тебя там нового? Э, у меня, у меня вот код, ну, ну он старый, да, ничего нового. Код у тебя старый, где у тебя код? Ну как? Это ну, я вот. не вижу как. Вот, 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 вот. Ну ладно, Луч, самый лучший код это мертвый код в моем понимании. Он не мертвый, он, он просто не живой. Это хороший код. Никаких аллергий. Маскот, мой маскот. Ну ты, конечно, в Праге, да, не в Москве. <смех> Интересно. Тут сам в Майами куда-то уехал. А меня в Москву хочу послать. Не. <смех> а как в Майами, какими судьбами? У меня тут такой тур Северной Америки. Восемь а, выступлений за три недели. Сейчас вот тут крыша от соавтора меня здесь в университете в Майами. А, то есть база именно сама Майами? Да нет никакой базы. Здесь два дня, потом а. А, потом в Информс, в Индианаполис, потом Канада, Могил. Ну, круто. А. Круто. Это ты вот да. так собрал, чтобы вот такую поездку сделать? Ну да, тичинга нету. И потом тут приглашали тут на несколько вещей. Я, конечно, на одну вещь бессмысленно ехать, поэтому все там это, конечно. Все лучше собрать в одно место и в одно месте. Ну, вообще весь континент, не то, что, не то, что это, не то, что рядом. Ну, так тут, так сказать, это все эпсилон, окружность. А, 
с базой, да. Конечно. Да, да. Ну ладно, мне тут сейчас надо идти завтрак, иначе я не давай, успею. Давай. давай. Ну давай, приятно было тебя увидеть. Такого, значит, хорошенького. Пока. Да, счастливо.